Welcome to ANN in Depth. In this episode, we'll talk about the future of Adventist communication. We have with us Alyssa Truman, the newest member of the communication department of the world headquarters of the Seventh day Adventist Church, to talk about this very important issue. Alyssa, has worked as a co-porter in her early years and even led co-porting teams. We'll tell you what that means in a minute. And she has worked for Adventist World Radio and now as an assistant director of communication. She is mainly responsible for news of the World Church as well as social media. Alyssa, welcome to ANN In Depth. Well, thank you, Sam. I'm excited to be here. Let's talk about co-porting, first of all. It's a form of communication. And my mother was a co-porter for many years, and we describe it as selling books to people that don't want to buy books with the money they don't have to buy books. What exactly is co-porting, and why did you love it so much for so many years? Uh, so co-portering is, is, is basically what you just said. So people go, we have books that we bring to people's doors. It's cold knocking, so it's not like we always have leads. Sometimes you have leads, depending on you know which level you're at. And we bring them books and we try to convince them that these books will change lives because we know that they will change life. That's why we love it is because we know essentially the very books that we're showing them are books that will change their lives. So we often will have nutrition type books. We'll have like cookbooks and stuff like that. But then we have children's books. We'll have like the blue Bible story set or Uncle Arthur's bedtime stories. Things that create incredible moments of meaning within homes. And if there's something I know as a parent, we want to make memories with our children. We want to raise them right. We give them the tools to raise them right. And then it comes to how do we take care of ourselves? And that's where you'll see the great controversy, Steps to Christ, Desire of Ages, all of those books come into play at that part of the conversation. We've been doing that for a very long time. In fact, print is the first way that the Adventist Church communicated with the world back in the 1840s when we were just a, a, a small movement after the Great Disappointment, we, we bought a printing press at great sacrifice to the pioneers and we started printing, printing a small journal and distributing that and trying to get offerings to sustain the ministry itself. So print has always been a form of communication for the Adventist Church and you started your work for the church, I suppose, uh, with print because you were selling books. Now you are at the cutting edge of social media and we're going to go through, you know, your time with AWR and y you never worked, which is the radio, Adventist mm -hmm. World Radio. And even though you never w worked in television, Adventist television, you have a good idea of what that means. Uh, so let's progress in this. We, we started with print. Around the 20s, we developed radio ministries. Um, tell me more about that. So the church has always wanted to use whatever was at our, our fingertips to be able to convey the message. Um, we believe strongly that our job is to proclaim the message of the soon return of Jesus. So whenever there's something new, there's always this push and pull within the church. Like, do we embrace it? Do we not? And eventually we always do embrace it and we try to find how we can use that. So Voice of Prophecy was one of the first ones to truly embrace radio. Um, HMS Richards knew that this was technology that we need to use moving forward. And so they started a, a radio show that continued to grow and grow and was soon reaching millions of homes. Um, back at a time where radio was a thing that everyone listened to. We would turn on the radio, you know, and gather around and listen without being able to see. And so we just, we embraced that and we started preaching the gospel message. People were coming into our churches because of what they heard on the radio. HMS Riches started in the 20s. Voice of Prophecy started in the 30s. But it took 40 years to have a global radio project or institution or entity or organization, whatever you want to call it, called Adventist World Radio. Television, Faith for Today, started in the 50s, and then Vanderman, and it is written eventually, etc. And it took 40 years, so the 90s is when we started Hope Channel International, which was the, there were television projects before, but that was the global uh, response of Adventism to television. 
Um, and it seems to take 40 years consistently between us first, between a pioneer using something and then eventually having the world church embracing it and making something of it. Um, what are your thoughts about this delay in opportunity until we finally get hold of a global structure to make it happen? Mm. <laughs> I don't like delay. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a highly competitive person, um, as you know. I don't like delay. I think that I understand why there is often delay. Um, I think that sometimes what we're seeing now, though, is that our members themselves are actually picking up on the newest iterations of technology. But sometimes it's harder to get to the world church because there's a lot of committees, there's a lot of structure in order to be able to approve the next step of it. There's a reason behind it. Would I like there to be less delay? Yes, absolutely. I think that we need to be the cutting edge on every level of the church, not just members embracing how to use YouTube, but every level within our structure, all the way up to the general conference. Um, we should have had a lot more podcasts, for instance, um, like coming out of the general conference, coming out of our unions, coming out of our divisions. We have a lot of incredible members who are using it, but why has it taken us so long? And I think that we are, we are improving that gap though. It's not 40 years anymore. We're, we're moving it slowly to be a shorter and shorter time period. And I think there's enough of us here who love technology, that we're actually thinking about the technology that's coming, not just the technology that's here. Social media started in the early 2000s, and you're right. We, we now have uh, a project that is at least, I don't know, three years old called the Digital Evangelism Initiative that has taken hold of that, um, of that idea and invested quite a bit of time and effort um, in social media. But we'll get to that in a minute. Let's go back to the end of the 80s. We had a public relations department, a communications department. It uh, tried to get some of our news inside other journals. So this would be known today as media relations and somewhat of a public relations. Uh, but we did not have a logo. We did not have any of this structured. Tell me about the shift that it, we experienced in the 90s. So we were, we were very focused on evangelism at the communication department, but we did need to corporately have a better identity. We needed to help the world know who we were. Not that just that there is an Adventist church, but who the Adventist church is. And so at this time, Lynn Caldwell, um, I'm trying to remember who was the director at that time. I remember Eventually Lynn. Eventually Ray DeBrosky. Okay, Ray DeBrosky. Yeah. So Lynn Caldwell, I'm, I'm specifically mentioning her name because Lynn so proudly, um, I met with her the a little while ago, and she showed me this package. Um, it had a, an old VHS cassette in it and these like workbooks that people could look at. But they created the identity, the logo for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this was really needed. We needed an era of professionalism that our church had not had previous to this. Ray Dabrowski decided that we really need to just to take our church to the next level. Um, ANN was born during this time. So rather than just this hodgepodge of news maybe coming from somewhere, we have this now very focused way to be able to share globally what is happening within our church structure. Um, so we took from being evangelism, Bible schools and stuff, which was what the communication department used to do. And we said, okay, but we need to be better. We need to have this professional identity. The world needs to know who we are. And that was what Ray Dabrowski helped usher in um, during the 90s. That corporate communication structure and a lot of our schools of communication follow suit and try to, to create or to develop a, a new generation that understood corporate communication and NPR, public relations, media relations, et cetera crisis management, uh, reputation management, and so on. But then came the internet, as our treasurer, Elder Paul Douglas says, um, then came the internet. Let's talk a little bit about the impact of the internet in our structure. So up until the 90s, the general conference was 
communicating only with our world divisions, right? So let's, let's revisit our global structure. A group of Adventist churches forms a local conference. All the tithe and offering is given to a conference, and that's uh, the, the legal body that employs the pastors within a, a region. Then a group of conferences forms a union. So a union is uh, typically a country, although some countries have more than one unions, more than one union, uh, but it's a, it's a larger body that coordinates the work of a conference. And then all the unions in the world form the general conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Because the world is so large, we, this office in Silver Spring cannot coordinate the work that happens all over the world. So we divide the world into 13 divisions, and those are the divisions through which uh, the work of mission is coordinated on a more local level. So the General Conference worked with divisions and attached fields, we call them. So some unions that report directly to the General Conference. And communication in particular and other departments, we would communicate with the divisions and they would either translate the resources that we created or they would share those locally. But all of those things were geographically bound. If you have a television program about a particular initiative of the General Conference inside one region of the world, let's take, for example, Inter-America. Uh, whatever television uh, geography it reaches, that's where people know about that. So the divisions could, could shift and, uh, and localize the content of the project to match their local reality. And they would translate some projects to some regions and other projects to other regions. But the General Conference never talked to members. The General Conference never talked to, to people on the ground, to visitors, uh, for instance. But then when the internet arrived, this began to shift, especially with Google. Because now if people searched for the Adventist church, wherever it is that they are in the world, it is easier for them to find, it's more likely for them to find the global channels than the local channels. And social media came to make that absolutely impossible to change. So our 100 plus year old structure, because the structure that I described is from 1903, um, by the time you have the launch, of, I think of Facebook in 2003, about 100 years later, or it could have been 1901, I don't remember exactly, I wasn't there. So <laughs> at some point in the beginning of the 20th century, we decided our global structure. And at some point in the beginning of the 21st century, that structure had to be adapted when it comes to communication. So what we have today is, is our response to this. It took 20 years, Alyssa, for the, for the World Church to begin to understand the, the, the sheer impact of um, Google. So today, every Adventist has at least two relationships with the church. They have a local church relationship but they also have a world church relationship that is managed uh, by the communications department at the general conference level if it belongs to a language that spans more than one division. So let me explain that. In the physical space, you have to contend with geography. There is this territory and that territory. And if somebody is, is connected to a church in one territory, um, everything that happens afterwards is led from that relationship. So if somebody, we have two conferences near where we are here in Silver Spring, Maryland. You have the Potomac Conference, uh, which is just south of here. And then you have the Chesapeake Conference that is just north of here. And to make matters more confusing, you have the- um, Allegheny East. Allegheny East Conference that spans both of these territories. So. How does that, what does that mean? It means that if you're a member of one of these conferences, your tithe goes to that conference and the work is managed by that conference, wherever it is that you are. Um, but when it comes to digital, there's no territory. When it comes to digital, a church here can be and is ministering to people all over the world in many different countries. So the digital does not respect geography, the digital respects language. So tell us a little bit about the strategy of which languages will be managed, the relationships that will be managed in each language, that the general conference was, uh, would absorb that complexity 
through social media channels. Tell me more about that. So you, you've already kind of stated that there's four of them and it's based on which languages go beyond a division. So for instance, Russian is only spoken as an official language in one division. Tagalog is only spoken in one division officially. So, but there are four languages that are spoken across multiple divisions. And as you say, there are 13 world divisions. So the first one being English, which is what we're speaking here in. Um, and then we have Spanish, Portuguese, which you speak because you have Brazilian roots there, and French. So those four languages cross multiple divisions. And so it's very hard for, like, we'll say a country like Brazil. Brazil is, when you think of Portuguese, you think Brazil. But actually, there's a whole country called Portugal that is where the language's name is based off. But it's not the one we think of when we think of Portuguese. And so it's, it's hard, though, because Brazilians are creating all of this content, but are they creating it for the Portuguese speakers in Europe? But what about Angola in Africa? And how do how does that all change? And it's hard to have one area have to all of a sudden create content for all these areas that are outside their area. So we have decided that that's a complexity that we as a world church have to take on and to be able to figure out how to bring them together and to collaborate and to curate and put all of that content there to be able to reach all Portuguese speakers and not just those in a specific division. So part of the, the, the future of Adventist communication is uh, managing that relationship uh, that people have with their world church. And this has to happen uh, globally uh, because digital respects language. It does not respect geography or time zone or anything else for that matter. So this is a shift. It is very different from what we normally do. Uh, our team of 10, 11 people here at the General Conference, there is no structure here uh, to communicate and, and lead relationships with now 2.4 million people that follow our various social media channels. It's it's impossible for us to do that. So we've expanded our team somewhat. Um, Just a little bit. <laughs> tell, tell us about the structure of our team and who who how did we set this up um so that people can uh, come in and out of our projects uh, based on their needs and availability and 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 cost and where these people are so the digital evangelism initiative um is i believe what we're referring to here and it's what we've done is we've we've created a system because one of the parts that is a challenge is trying to figure out how do we take and scale something? How do we have scalability? How do we make it so we can use people from different parts around the world and to be able to still employ them? So we actually use Upwork and are able to hire people on for specific projects or for longer lengths of time, and we can employ them anywhere in the world, which is fabulous because we literally are running a 24 seven, op well, 24 six operation. We do try to take the Sabbath off. But um, we run, we basically are running 24 hours a, d a day around the clock. And so, you know, we have team members in the Philippines, for instance. And so as I'm getting ready to go to bed, you know, they're, they're picking up the torch and they're carrying on the work. And so when I wake up, a bunch of work has been done and we can move forward. But we have people on pretty much every continent that are working alongside us at this point, except for Antarctica. We have not conquered that one yet. But our goal is to to use the world church family, the gifts and the talents that God has given them, and to be able to to identify and honor those gifts and and to use them for the different tasks that are needed. So so the digital evangelism initiative allowed us the freedom to move beyond a full time employee that works here to being able to find people, use those talents. And now we have a team of, I'm going to, I'm going to totally mess up the number. I'm going to say over 150 working. That's accurate. Okay. Yeah. Over 150 working all the time on projects for the Adventist church. Yeah. Who the 150 people are changes sometimes because one project ends, the other begins, or uh, their contribution to the project is, is completed and they're waiting for the next one to come in. But this this is a, a game changer 
In fact, let's talk about the structure that we use for this because a lot of people that are listening to this are like, well, hold on a minute. So you have over 150 people that are part of the general conference communications team. That's not quite accurate. Uh, we have about 600 freelancers around the world that we call upon as and when needed. And at any given point, we have 150 of them working at a time in multiple projects. Some of them are developers. Some of them are writers and editors and photographers and 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 video editors and you know two of them are right here recording this podcast um and all of this is only one aspect of the operation so let's talk about the management and the leadership of the production side of things uh, we we split our structure into three layers uh, the first layer is the artists that's that's really, you know, a translator is an artist, a developer is an artist. We consider them all artists. They're responsible for executing and delivering on the strategy. And these artists are, are very precious. In fact, leading artists is very difficult. Yes, it is. Right? My husband's an artist. We're artists. Yes. Um, it's, it's a gift they are giving to the church and you have to know how to be able to speak their language you have to kind of remove them from the, the administrative level that sometimes does not communicate doesn't know how to speak artist language um and we do we have a phenomenal group of of artists and i i want to point something out to that i think is interesting because i think when people think about the adventist church especially when they think about the general conference we often talk about ages um we have an incredibly vast amount of people who are working from, for us with different ages. The youngest that we have had previous was 16, um, working but, on Heroes. But yesterday we interviewed a 15-year-old. We 15-year-old who is a phenomenal writer. And this and th this will bring us into the next tier. But one of the things that we do, so we have all these artists, these creatives um, in their their early 20s, late 20s, all the way down to apparently maybe 15 here soon, but that they love the idea of working for the church. They love the idea of using their talents and gifts, but what they really need is someone to kind of help them learn what to do, to mentor them, to inspire them, which brings us to the second level. No, but I have, I, oh, I would, no, wait, oh, we have wait, to, wait, wait, wait. But wait, it's like such a great. I tell you okay. what the artists do not need, more meetings. No, they so, <laughs> Nobody needs more meetings. Hate Sam. Meetings, right? They don't. They, it's counterproductive. It's it's generally not something that anybody loves. So we try our best to have systems in place where we have the least meetings possible. Yes, we now, do. Now we were forced there um, because of the different time zones. You know, how do you have a meeting between uh, the the uh, West Coast of the United States, Africa, India, and the Philippines together. It's its practically impossible. And then you add Australia to the I was going to say throw an Australian, it totally messes done. it up. <laughs> so we have people in Australia, we have people all over. So it's very difficult to have meetings. How do we coordinate? Um, how do you can coordinate the work without uh, meetings? And we produce, just to put into context, f about 20,000 pieces of original content every year plus the equivalent of 25 books uh, written. This is, this is a, a large operation of, cre of creativity. And that's just the production side. So these artists that are doing this, um, we define that everyone in our team needs three things. And most of us read a lot, and this research keeps coming back in almost every book that I read about motivation. And there are three things that people need, and we try to give as, as much of those three things as possible to every artist and everyone in the team. The first is autonomy. You know, you tell me to do the dishes, but don't tell me how. You know, when you tell, start telling an artist exactly how they're going to do their art, uh, they don't appreciate that. Y you only get beginners if you do that. Those that have experience... And there is a time to tell people exactly what to do, usually when they're beginning their craft. You know, when you get a uh, maybe a 20-something-year-old who hasn't done what you're asking of them, you're asking them to do something they've never done before. You need to tell them exactly what to do, otherwise they become anxious and you lose them. 
But when you work with the, with someone that has been doing what they do since they were 12 years old, and now they have 10, 15, 20,000 hours of doing it, <laughs> no, just, just give them the mission, but give them the autonomy to deliver the results that you want, which leads to the second point, which is mastery, right? Mastery. The ability to have a set of numbers, to have a goal, and for them to pursue that goal, whatever that may be, and to try and get better this week than they were last week, this month than they were last month. So that mastery is incredibly important. And the third aspect of it. Is my favorite. Go for it. It's purpose. People have to have purpose. There's nothing harder than to have a job and being able to do it well, but not really loving what you do. And one of the things that if you work for the church, you never have a shortage of purpose because we know what our what our job is to do. We are here to proclaim the gospel. Every person matters. Showing them the love of Jesus matters. Purpose is never something we have a shortage of in the Adventist church. And when you mix purpose with giving people the autonomy and then the mastery, it is this beautiful thing. Um, and I just speaking for my own self, like seeing how like when I learned these principles and being able to start doing it, my own growth, my own love of my job became like, you just, you fall in love with it. You cannot wait to wake up and go to work every day. I talk, however, with a lot of people that work for the Seventh-day Adventist Church in different parts of the world who do not experience that same purpose. It is possible for you to be oblivious of how your work will contribute to the work. And, and this is where good management and good leadership comes in. So we have the artists, um, but the artists, they need to work and operate within a framework. They need to have a specific task and mission ahead of them. It's, it, it's not just open. Otherwise, uh, you, you know, an artist needs a, a canvas to paint on uh, if they are a painter. So the second layer are the managers. And this includes two parts, manager, management and supervision. M management is responsible for getting things done. And supervision? Getting it done right. How does this two, same tier, but two level structure between the task managers and the supervisors, how does that play out in practice and, and how useful is it in our team? Oh, it's very, it's, it's vital. So we have project managers for every project. And when you talked about how we don't like meetings, this is literally how we've solved this. Um, we have really phenomenal tools that we use. Um, we use monday.com and we use Brandwatch. And all of these tools matter, but the only, the only way they work is if you have this manager who makes sure that all the flow continues going, that nothing gets stuck. That's why we're saying that they just need to make sure it's done. So if you're supposed to be approving this episode, because once this episode gets done, we're going to have to go through, you know, the editors and then the, the video team is going to have to like do stuff. And then the, the design team is going to have to create the thumbnails. And then the writers are going to have to create the description. Okay. It could get stuck somewhere in there because someone just doesn't see that they're supposed to do it. The manager makes certain that it moves down that entire chain so that those of you who are listening to this right now, you can hear it because they all did their job. So the manager makes sure, makes sure that they get it done. The supervisor makes sure it is done right. So they will look at it and they will listen and be like, ha, did you hear like she stuttered in that part or oh, we could hear something clanging back there. Like that should have been cut out or you spelled the person's name wrong on the bottom of the screen. You know, that is not the job of the manager. He just makes certain that it is done. The other person is looking for the little details. Was the spelling right? Was their title correct? Does the thumbnail convey what it needs to convey? Is the description of the episode accurate? Is it pointing back to where it's supposed to? They look at the big picture and they take the strategy that has been conveyed to them to make certain that the episode fulfills the what was sent to them to have be done. This system has, we found it to be so effective because those that have the, we call it control country, 
they like getting things done. Uh, but they they would always sacrifice getting it right. Uh, that's generally the tension. Finding people that want to get it done and want to get it right is the rarest thing in the <laughs> world. Usually people tend toward one or the other. So when we split those two and put two different people, you have experts that have lots of experience with that particular media type and that specific thing that they are that they are supervising for. It also allows for multiple supervisors on the same project. Mm -hmm. You could have a supervisor that is looking just at the search engine optimization uh, uh, elements of this video. And then you have a supervisor for sound. You could have a supervisor for that. that that's all they look at. They come in, they look at the sound, and they go, yeah, they could be improved here. Let's remove this frequency. Let's do that and the other. Um, and then they don't do the work. If something needs to be changed, it goes back to the artist, so the artist learns how to make it better and better and better, which means that we are in the constant process of turning artists into supervisors, of taking people that have done their 10,000 hours that are brilliant at something and allowing them to pour that knowledge, that experience, that mentorship for artists that are just beginning into doing that particular art in this particular way. Um, so that's another... Uh, mentorship is embedded within the model and, and something so I work I, I I started off at the artist aspect and I've moved kind of like through these different tiers and, and sometimes you kind of fluctuate between a few of them but the thing that I have loved is spotting the talents that people have that God-given talents and being able to help push them to use those a little bit more. So someone who came on just as a writer, I'm going to actually call this person out. So Rachel, um, she came on, she was a writer. And then she stopped for a while because of life situations. And she kind of came back and we started utilizing her. And Rachel moved from the artist. And I could see the potential. I could see the gifts that God had given has given her. And as more stuff moved onto my plate, I realized there were certain things I could not do anymore. But because of this system that we had created, I had, in a sense, already mentored the person who could take over those responsibilities I had. And now Rachel's overseeing the entire writer process. She makes sur certain that things are being done right. She translates the vision that we give her, and she delivers that to them. And it's, it's created this beautiful synergy within the group and the interesting thing is if you ask these people who've come it's like they love it and they want to know like what's the next step like where can we go to next um because it's rare to be mentored in our jobs you know we talk about mentorship we talk about investing in the next generation but i sat i'm sad to say that i rarely see it done for as much as we talk about it and i love seeing that when it is happening, how it actually just builds this excitement. And so as we mentor them, they mentor those underneath them. And they start looking for those same characteristics like how we saw to start encouraging them. And I actually just finished telling Rachel, I said, you need to find two people to mentor in the next year. And so like the whole thing is that we need to pass this knowledge on. I, I was very surprised by this when I arrived because I arrived into this culture, uh, especially with Williams the director of communication. So Pastor Williams Cluster Jr. has been in communication for many years, but the first part of his ministry was in music. So in Brazil specifically. So he taught music for 22 years, I think it was 21, 22 years. And the students that he taught have changed music in Brazil to the point that we have a thriving culture of Adventist musicians mm. that I have not seen anywhere else in the world, not in Europe, not in America, not in Africa, not in the Philippines, not anywhere. Why? Because there were a, a group of students that he mentored that would that became great leaders within music. But before he could see them through, he was called to start communication. So same thing happened. The people that started uh, the television channels with him and so on are now leading various aspects of uh, Hope Channel in Brazil. And one of them is even here at uh, Hope Channel International. So when I arrived, he took the time to mentor me in ways that I did not expect or that I had not seen before. Because being a mentor is, 
is not easy because you need to look to the person you're mentoring and tell them the truth. You are not capable of doing this yet and you need to get better at this. And then the time to, you know, come sit here and we read emails together. I remember Williams doing this a long time. It's like, okay, see, this is what they're saying, but that's not what they mean because they come from this part of the world and when they say this, they actually mean something entirely different. Um, and it takes years to learn that. So this, this culture of mentorship, no, your, your, particular, your speech was good in this way, but don't make that joke anymore. You know, being a mentor is interfering in the business of the person you're mentoring to the point that it could be shocking. It could be, it's like you don't accept any, you don't accept that from anyone else but the person who believes you can do more than you're doing I now. I think there's a whole episode on mentorship that's going to be coming in the future I think because I, like, I it, like it's, it. it's too important to like. I like it. So this is the, 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 the structure of artists and managers. Then you come to leaders. Okay, so the third is, uh, is leaders. Somebody needs to set the strategy and vision. And the creation of the strategy and vision cannot involve hierarchy. When we come into a room to discuss an idea or a project, if hierarchy enters through the door, creativity leaves through another door. They cannot coexist in the same space. So in order to create an environment where the best idea has to win, that is the most difficult thing to do in any church structure. In fact, it's not just a church, in any corporate structure. Because corporations are obsessed with, do you have permission to do this or not? Uh, who, who gave you the right to do this or not? That's what we normally worry about. But inside this room where creativity exists and hierarchy doesn't, um, the best idea has to win. It's not about the loudest voice. It's not about the most powerful voice. It's about the best idea. So we struggle and we struggle. And once, a, once there is a strategy and a vision uh, that is set by leadership, the managers who are part of that conversation generally, they translate the strategy and vision to their respective teams. And when the supervisor, uh, supervision, when the supervision people are looking at something, they are making sure that what the artist did matches the vision. It isn't just, is it good or not? No, it, does it align with the vision that has been laid out for this project? Or doesn't it? Uh, and if it doesn't, then you know, let's change if we can, or adapt it at least. Uh, so leaders, managers, and artists, whenever we have a new project, we put that on the board and we go through, you know, so who is responsible for, who's leading this project? You know, strategy and vision, and for that particular area. So take Adventist.org, for example. There is an element of Adventist.org that has to do with, um, uh, production and another element that has to do with pastoral care and another element that has to do with uh, s search engine optimization and so on and so forth. And sometimes you need managers and supervisors and leaders for each of these areas, although you have one vision for the project itself. So that's one element of everything that we talked about. When this goes live, 20,000 posts a year, just in English, and then you have the others in other languages. It's, it's unbelievable what the team pulls off. I, I'm humbled every time I even think about it. Um, when people start engaging with it, then comes the second part of the future of, of Adventist communication, which is if people are relating to a church, they should expect online pastoral care will happen thereafter. So tell me more about online pastoral care. So when I, I'm, the, the best way I can explain this is I've had conversations with my children. I struggle with this myself. Um, if somebody texts me, I feel like I need to text them back pretty immediately. That's kind of the world that we live in now. Um, whether it's just like a thumbs up or like a statement, whatever. Today, people expect that if I send you a message, I'm going to get a response back. If I don't get some sort of response, it actually hurts the loyalty to the brand. It hurts the their impression of that organization. And so if there's no response ever, so they don't think you actually care. 
what they think is that you're just there to sell them on something and they don't want to be sold. This is not a sales. This is a relationship. So what online pastoral care is and what we've really worked on doing is we have a team of people again around the world and everybody who sends a message gets a response within 24 hours. Um, our goal is to do it within three minutes. Um, sometimes because sleeping or whatever, maybe doesn't always hit that. But our goal is three minutes from the time you send a message on our Facebook channel through Messenger or wherever you get a message. If you leave a comment on one of our posts, that there's some sort of interaction with it. And all of these need to lead to having a relationship. If you write me and say, I need prayer. And I said, okay, prayed for you. Pretty ineffective. If you're coming to a church and asking to be prayed for, you're literally saying, pray with me. You know, it, it like if you can't ask a church to pray for you, then like who can you ask, right? So if you ask me to pray for you, I say, what, what's going on, Sam? What's going on in your life? What specifically can I pray for? And then you share that with me. And people are very willing to share online. Um, just as much as you see people maybe spouting things we don't necessarily love online, people are also willing to share and open their hearts in that same manner. So there's, there's always that push and that pull with that openness that we have online. So then I pray not just for you, I pray with you digitally. I will record a prayer, I will type a prayer, and we will send that prayer to you. But that's not enough. If you're asking for prayer because your son just got injured, okay, which I could see some of your kids maybe getting injured. Oh, They're it happens very... all the time. <laughs> yes, this is a recurrent prayer. So, I mean, you know, we'll, we'll say one of them decides that they're going to get injured and you send this prayer request. Somebody should follow up with you. It's not just that I pray with you. I care about you. The church has to, to be seen as who we really are. We are a group of people who genuinely care for others, not because I want you to become an Adventist, but because you are a child of God and I love you as Christ loved me. So I will follow up with you and I will ask you, Sam, how is your son doing? I've been praying for him. And then you'll respond. I'll be, is there anything else I can pray for? And now we start this relationship and that is what people want. They're not coming to be sold. They're coming to create relationships. That, that's really powerful. We had over 2 million prayer requests sent or conversations um, by just, it, it's around half a million people at this point that we've interacted with over the last few years on the World Church channels, mainly on Facebook and Instagram. And out of all of those people, at some point we had 140, I think, yeah, about 140 in the online pastoral care team. We were testing to see what difference does it make to, to actually pray for people, which was an interesting experiment. At first, it would be more or less customer service. You know, they asked for prayer, we respond, we prayed for you, and, and a team would pray, and but that was it. Then we hired 30 independent contractors who would just pray. They would spend all their days praying. And these were not the young people. You know, the, some of them were young, but many of them were, you know, the, the elders in the local churches, those that have callous knees, uh, the prayer warriors that we would normally It was my grandmother. To. Yeah, exactly. So we had uh, 30 of them in the Philippines, most of them in Manila. And when we established that, we saw a definitive increase in the number of prayers answered. And this could be a phenomenal study one day in the future because when you talk about prayer, it seems that nothing much happens. But when you actually pray, a lot happens. Mm -hmm. And we want to provide genuine online pastoral care to everyone who contacts us. Sometimes, many times, they're Adventists. Most of the time, they are not Adventists, um, mainly because we offer prayer through the ads uh, Facebook ads and Instagram ads. We want to build new relationships with people. And it is in the genuine care of those people that they are really interested in the truth. 
So the truth is not interesting if the people that are delivering it don't follow it themselves. So when, when Jesus lived the way he lived, he was reflecting ultimate reality, which is love. If you do not care for people, no amount of truth that you are saying will make any difference in anyone else because you are not living out that truth yourself. It is just uh, an exercise in marketing. Um, mm. And we are not here to just ex to do exercises in marketing. All of our social channels are there to create an environment for real transformation where people are transformed one step at a time into people that reflect Jesus, including and especially ourselves. Every content that we create reflects that. And our writers and our creative team and, and everyone is in a constant journey with Christ to encapsulate what's going on in their lives so that they can inspire others uh, that are engaging with the content. So that has been some of the differences over the last two years. In the past, before that, a lot of our content was very corporate, you know, corporate content. We, we put our beliefs, we put this and that, and we had three shares, 10 shares, 30 shares would be like amazing. Uh, since our artists have begun to write and to create content based on their own journey with God and, and how they see it, we've gone to 300 shares, 800 shares sometimes, more than, than 10x what used to be because humans want to connect with humans right and i think this is this is this has all been the evolution of how um communication has trans been transformed so we started off very evangelistic but maybe we needed a level of professionalism and then we had this generation of leaders who came in and and brought the beauty of professionalism into the work that we do corporate communication Co corporate communication and now we've been able to build on that just as we always should be we should always be building on the the legacy and the heritage of our past and now we are we are adapting to to what the society has thrown us where where google has placed us at people's fingertips and so now we have that 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 air of professionalism mixed with the evangelism and it's just created this beautiful synergy into to really reaching people's hearts and minds. And it's it's a really it's a it's a huge privilege to be able to work on this, but it's it's more exciting almost to see even within our own team their transformation as that they are able to be a part of this. Because as they are working to to give online pastoral care or to write copy to try to help people fall in love with Jesus, to see the same Jesus that we see, it changes their own devotional walks. It changes their own prayer lives. And then as that has changed, you see it in the post and then people respond more to the post and it becomes this beautiful cycle um, because as we reach them, they reach us and it's just, it's a full circle experience. We call it a community. <laughs> yeah, community, there you go. I, I wanna spend the, the last few minutes talking about why all this matters. Okay, so we started with print, we went to radio, we went to television, and now we are fully engaged in digital while maintaining print, radio, and television. Nothing ends. More people bought books in the last 10 years than in the history of humanity. I heard that somewhere, and you may want to check that at some point. No, uh, but if it's not that, it's close. People don't stop buying books. Television isn't dead. Neither is radio. Nothing dies. It seems that we just keep increasing the number of hours we spent on those platforms. So now that we have digital, we're using the latest and greatest technology to some degree. Yesterday I had a conversation with someone who believes we should start the conversation about blockchain and how to use tokenization to sponsor mission. And uh, we studied this very deeply and maybe there is a time and a place for that to happen. At the moment, I don't think there is enough trust by our members and others with all the scams and everything that happened for us to, to launch a project like this. But if it is, if it materializes as a form of, uh, of, of technology that is solid, then I'm sure Adventists at some point will get started. So we're not really at the cutting edge social media. There is no cutting edge in social media. It's been around for 20 years. We're not even using all the social media we can. That's right. So like right now we're on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Um, 
But what about TikTok? I mean, we're about ready to start kind of moving into that realm. But like Spanish, it's an entire. The Spanish channels have already launched. The Spanish TikTok, channels have. Yeah. I know Portuguese is getting ready too. Yeah. But like we literally are missing an entire generation. Um, what about Discord? You know, we like people don't know what Discord is, but an entire generation knows what Discord is. Um, I know what Discord is because I have children. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't probably know what Discord is. But how are we? That's that's a place where people go to make community. We're not there. If we're not there, I mean, there are certain organizations there, but the Seventh Day Adventist Church is not there. How do we create community that isn't cringy, as my kids would say, um, and meet these people where they are at? I mean, there's so many things that we where we haven't quite dived deep. So you're right, we we are we are not ahead. There's a lot of work to be done. The metaverse. Yeah. You know, is the metaverse going to become a real thing? And if so. Are we going to wait 40 years to get into it? We can't because I will tell you the metaverse will be will be kind of something, be something over else. here. <laughs> and like we have to we have to be already knowing what is coming and we need to start strategically thinking what do we need? And this this whole scalable system that we've created allows for for that complexity to actually be embraced. And I think it would have been harder for us to embrace all of this new stuff if we didn't have that. Because by allowing us to to find people and to be able to do it if i had to run all the social media channels of the world church myself you'd get one post a day it'd be very well thought out because i'm a perfectionist but it would be slow moving i would not be able to respond and how to many people. relationships could you maintain to not a lot online not a lot let's, no. let's go with maybe a hundred if i'm if i'm you know being really generous with myself but this allows, with the different levels of that we talked about, it allows leadership to sit there and actually be thinking through, okay, how does Discord work? How does, how does the metaverse kind of come into it? And it allows us to start being able to grapple with these things because we can take on more responsibility, more ideas, because we're not having to fulfill all three levels beneath us. I see there is a theological problem that um, that may stop us from being successful with all the communication that we just described. And all of our, I think all conversation at some point hits theology. And if we are not uh, aware of the theological dimensions of our conversations, we haven't gone deep enough. So I have encountered this new our pioneers believed that they should use every communication channel to increase the chances of their loved ones and strangers that in faraway lands uh, to be ready for the second coming of jesus a hundred and almost 150 years ago when the church decided to send john andrews into the wild which was you know to europe. the world <laughs> europe <laughs> They did it because they believed that they would increase the chances of Europeans and the rest of the world from being ready for the second coming of Jesus and to live eternally. They believed that what they did increased the chances of people living forever. So we, they approach communication as a life and death situation. You get this right, more people will be in heaven because of it. You get this wrong, there are people that might not be there because you got it wrong. That's what they believed. And traditionally, that's what Adventists believe. Over the last few decades, however, I have seen a different kind of theological thought being put out, which is essentially how arrogant can you be to believe that your actions will have an influence in someone's life eternally? Doesn't God love them? God will find a way to communicate with them and, and have them be rejected. It doesn't really matter what you do uh, to impact people's lives. If God wants to save them, he will. So just make sure that you are sticking close to God and keep your eyes on Jesus and you'll be fine. Both of those are not true. The sometimes either or statements in theology can be true. This one isn't. Either what you do really matters or what you do doesn't matter. And if we have new generations, and there are plenty of pastors that would consider the statement arrogant 
that what you do may bring salvation to some, and if you don't, they might not live forever. Some pastors will consider that to be um, to be a heretic thought to think that you and what you do can either help or hinder someone from going to heaven to the sense that if we don't get communication right, it's fine. God will find other ways. Who are you to think that you can you know, save people? Salvation is not up to you. It's up to God. And although that statement, that statement is true, I believe that if we get communication right, we significantly increase the chances of hundreds, thousands, millions, perhaps even billions of people from being ready when Jesus comes. What are your thoughts about that? We struggle as a people. What, what I see as our greatest challenge is we've lost the enthusiasm. To me, that's what I see is we've heard for so long that Christ is going to come and we've become complacent. It it, it may come in my lifetime, it may come in my children's, it might come in my great-grandchild's lifetime. They had this sense of urgency because they, they had lived through that great disappointment. They knew Christ was coming soon and everyone should be there with them. And I feel like we've lost that that beautiful message. Honestly, that's what it is. It's a beautiful message. It's not a doom and gloom. Okay. Cause it, to some people, that's what it can sound like. Literally it's saying, I want you to spend eternity with me. You could get in a car accident tonight. I, I know people who've been in traumatic car accidents. Were they ready? When I write something, when I, when I post something, Am I helping them to fall in love with Jesus? Am I helping them to see the truth that is found in Jesus? The Adventist Church has a promise. We can help you understand the Bible to find freedom, healing, and hope in Jesus. That is a promise the entire world needs. We need freedom. We need healing, and we need hope. It doesn't matter what country you're in, where you are politically, everyone needs freedom, healing, and hope, and it is something only Jesus can provide. And until we as members feel that promise within our own hearts, it's just going to be another post. We have to be changed by the gospel ourselves in order to help others to know the power of the gospel in their own lives. Many of the people listening, Alyssa, will know communication leaders in their local churches, in their conferences, unions, and they may send this video to them about at least our opinion about the future of Adventist communication. And we encourage them to do so. From our perspective. Yes, yeah, send it to <laughs> whoever should be looking at this, your pastor, maybe your pastor. Um, why don't you look into this camera here and talk to those communication leaders from your heart? What would be your dream for them? in the next few years of their ministry? I have been one of you. I have been a local church communication director. And I saw it as making sure that somebody was writing up a story to send to like the union or the conference office or making sure that pictures were taken. Your job is so much more than that. Your job is to proclaim the gospel to your community. And sometimes it's not even just your community. I know some of you who are running social media for your local church channels, and you're getting responses from all over the world. You are a minister. I didn't say you're the pastor, but you are a minister of the gospel in your role as a communication leader. Do not take that lightly. I pray every day for the communication leaders around this world, because each of you matter. Each of you have a special gift. That's why the church has placed you in this position at this time. I encourage you to get on your knees, meet with your pastor, find out how you can move your church's channels to being evangelistic, to sharing the gospel with others. Find members in your church who can respond 
to those messages that are going to be coming in. Because the moment you change, the moment you make this decision to change what you do, to be able to proclaim the gospel through your social media or whatever it is that you are doing, you are going to need church members who will be praying for those requests that come in. You're going to need people who can interact and it will become to the point where you cannot do it alone. That is what we pray for your church. And that is what I want to inspire you to work for in your local church. Thank you for watching and in depth. We hope you enjoyed this conversation about the future of Adventist communication, which is largely up to you. We hope that you subscribe to the channel, wherever channel you're watching this and that you click the little bell to get the new notifications. If you're listening on Spotify or iTunes, uh, thank you for downloading and following this podcast. We hope that you are greatly blessed and that if you are a communicator, that you will help us uh, build this future for a successful fulfillment of the mission God gave the Seventh-day Adventist Church.